Welcome back to yet another episode of Inside the Mind of On Carl B TV. Our second episode on Rumble. A very big thanks to Moby Tech Queensland and Manscaped for supporting the podcast. I have two guests today and I'm pumped as. I can't believe they came back to talk again. I've got Dr. Regan Gallagher and Dr. Tony Matthews back on the show. Welcome, gents. Thank, Thank you for having us. Yep. I really appreciate you coming out and I guess it might be a cool place to start. How, like, how do you guys know each other? How did you guys get come to become such good friends? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we did a Vipassana meditation together. I mean, we didn't know each other before this. We did a Vipassana meditation, which is a 10-day silent meditation um, together. And at the end of it, you can speak to the other people that are there um, and – so we'd spend 10 days meditating for 14 hours or so. Uh, Regan was, I think, behind me to the right or something. Um, and then on the last day, we got speaking and then we just stayed yeah, friends. And the brief glimpses you're allowed to actually open your eyes in this place. I've got his the back of his head to look at, <laughs> which uh, it was very inspiring. Yeah. Man's a good meditator. Well, you no, know, he's, got, he's got it down pat. You should see him. He's so serene, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's got great posture and the hair. And <laughs> it's interesting to hear blokes comment, uh, yeah. sorry, compliment each other on how they meditate. Yeah. That's really beautiful. It's, I, I shift around like a rodent, you know. <laughs> but it's also a perception thing because you're not aware of what's happening around you most of the time. So yeah, of course. you feel like you shift around. And you feel like you're mm. the only one and everybody else is serene. Right. right. Do you, could you feel like Tony's energy? Man, energy is a powerful thing in those places. You feel uh, a general energy of everybody there. Um, yeah. And I would say the more, the more focused energy that you feel is your own energy and your own experience. You're not feeling other people. But everybody's having a really deep experience. That's something that when everybody finally gets to talk, mm. everybody's had a wild experience. And that's probably, you know, why we became such good friends. Like we hang out all the time um, because then when you start connecting, you're connecting on meaningful things. You know, you haven't said anything to anybody for 10 days. Um, you've barely seen anything. You do also have these glimpses very briefly make contact with others just by accident. You know, you're eating near each other, you're meditating, moving in and out of the hall. So you have this, these like tiny little snapshots of these people in one of the most meaningful experiences of your life and then when you talk to them at the end like you just you know everybody's been through something quite profound so yeah you connect yeah i mean it's like you can't so it's very strict you can't speak but also obviously you can't have a phone or anything like that but no reading material no writing material um no outside like no nothing from the outside apart from clothes um you can't make eye contact you can't make physical contact you have to coexist with people but effectively try and pretend that they're not there they even have people who serve all your food, who come around and ring the bell to wake you up. Everything is curated for you. Your only job is to meditate. Um, and you described the experience before, you know, when you're in a sensory deprivation tank. It's fully dark. You can't feel anything. Um, but then you suddenly touch the side of the tank or something like that. And the amount of, like, vibration you feel, the energy you feel from that is, like, overwhelming. And it's, like, just this tiny little touch on your finger. And it can like send vibrations through your body. Well, it's the same sort of thing. Like the, you're focused so much on your inner energy when you're meditating. And then, you know, you make contact with another person. It's like you can imagine the significance and the meaning of that, making contact like that. Yeah, it's, it's insane to try and put myself in your shoes, like to do that experience. It's like just to, to not talk for 10 days, obviously, is one thing. But to, we're, we're so constantly stimulated by something, or I am anyway. Like I'm always looking for something to do or something to engage with. Uh, if, and it's your subconscious doing that, right? So you don't have to sit there and think. And when I finally get a chance to sit there and think, I just I love it. And I think to myself, why don't I do this more? And then I just don't, you know what I mean? It's it's just a part of my life that I'm in. But to to think that that's – like that's all you have for 10 whole days. We well, don't even have that in a sense. I mean, you think you have that, but you actually don't because you stop thinking, yeah, you okay. go beyond thinking yeah, and you just yeah. move into this kind of state of existing. Interesting. You say that. And it's just pure awareness basically yeah. because you're just right there. You might think about certain things from time to time for yes. sure, but basically you're, you're, you're just, you've disconnected from 
that's the material uh, world in some sense in and some gone, sense, gone yeah. beyond it you've calmed your mind to a point and you have where, nothing to think about because as Regan said everything is curated it's the same schedule every day your food is served to you twice a day um, or three times for some people yeah. um, and that's all you do you just sleep and meditate and eat and shower and repeat for 10 days straight and don't make eye contact and don't and you very quickly drop out of what you kind of perceive as normal reality, let's say. Mm, yeah. Massively, yeah. And in the there's the first couple of days are really like an arm wrestle because, you know, you what you described, I'm certainly guilty of that through probably the majority of my life, you know. One thing to the next, you know, technology, um, all kinds of things that stimulate you, um, even down to, you know, tea yeah. or coffee or something like that. Um, so it's these are things that you have to then wrestle with for the first few days, your mind doesn't quieten down. You know, all of that stimulation that's been going in is just sort of reverberating around your mind, like lyrics from a song, conversations you had with someone, like some random interaction with a stranger. These things take on like a very high volume and it's a several day arm wrestle. And if you get through that, then you start to really be able to do some deep, serious work on yourself. And then if you get through that, you come to this place of like serenity. And usually that can only, sometimes that only occurs at the ninth or 10th day for a lot of people, if they even make it, you know, yeah. these are. Well, it depends on how much you have to unpack, right? Like, yes. Yes. Yeah. But even as you go deeper and deeper, the unpacking is. Yeah, so, it's not like the unpacking is not in any kind of a linear process. It's yeah. like, it's not, it's not the sort of thing. And a lot of people go in there, if you like, with an intention that, you know, maybe there's certain problems they want to work on or maybe they want to find an answer to something. And they may or may not get there, but there's no linearity to the process. Yeah. So, like you might go in there with an objective, but that'll all disappear after a That's while. That's right. Right. And then, right. you know, two, three years down the track, something happens in your life that you like solve that problem that you initially had an intention with at Vipassana. But then all of a sudden you realize actually it did solve that problem. The, the, the lessons you learn about how your mind operates, how to be good, you know, have an ethic, have a morality, have a, and this is not prescribed to you in these retreat centers. This is coming from when you look inside yourself, how do you want to be? How, how do you no longer want to be? And then you change yourself and then you change yourself in the direction of um, you know, what you really wanted. That problem you wanted to solve in your life is solved because you changed yourself. And then these external problems somehow, and the, the mechanism is really hard to describe, but somehow they just evaporate. And yeah, and it comes back to dedication in these experiences, I yeah. think. I mean, I, I explained, and I'm not, going, I'm not going to explain it here, but I explained to, to Regan, you know, a, um, sort of part of the um, objective or the thing that I went into the first one with or the, the question I was wrestling with. Um, and I came out of it feeling like I had an answer. Um, and it was a question I couldn't logically answer and I, I, I just couldn't sure. rationally answer this question. So I thought, well, maybe I'll find an answer experientially. And I did, but what I didn't realize was that the answer was only the start of Right. of a, a much longer and more arduous process. So I was feeling pretty happy with myself. I got my answer. That was good. <laughs> you know, and then it took four years to close that circle. Mm. And then when it closed, it was like I could hear the sound of, of it close, you know, in my head. Uh, and it was very profound. So it does, mm. it can take a lot. And, and he's done what, three. I've only done one. Three, yeah. it, 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 it's cool. Like you still describe the discipline. Like So Bryce... For example, I'm now studying. So Bryce's best friend growing up uh, went on the path, path to become a Buddhist monk, has spent nights and nights in the Blue Mountain Caves and overseas uh, in temples meditating. Also uh, was homeless in Cindy, Sydney for a little while um, just to experience what that was like. Uh, it was crazy just to digress a tiny bit. He said that uh, it's funny how like you can be the exact same thing and do the exact same things in homeless in Sydney as well as in a temple mm. in the serene environment and how different you feel. Like you feel like an absolute piece of shit in Sydney <laughs> just because you're environment, but then you feel like you're validated and okay in this temple. Uh, but back to like you just mentioned, you go past that, like your brain for whatever reason only has the capacity to really dig deep for a couple of days and you go past that to this existing I don't know if I've ever seen that as like a, a good thing. Like, is that better? Is it, are they both just separate experiences? Should that be the end goal? Like, should you be 
a Buddhist for. I lack completely of a remember reason. my wrestling with this question as well. Yeah. Um, and I had a friend of mine who introduced me to Vipassana, and um, he he was always a few steps ahead of me on this kind of path, you know. And it was nice because then when I wrestled with the question, it was often he was able to answer it. Um, probably a bit like your friend. Um, and the thing is, we. <laughs> So my issue was like I really appreciated the, the all the things that I had done with my mind and my ego that um, had led me to certain places and or certain abilities or certain um, experiences that I knew I would have to give up if I wanted to be more, you know, um, uh, let's say on a spiritual path, I guess, meditating and serious about that. Um, and the way he explained it, and probably he would do it better, I can't do it justice, but it was – Along the lines of you don't really have anything to lose by doing these these experiences, uh, doing these, challenging yourself this way. You only have things to gain. You will gain the insight that you need to then when you're faced with some, these kinds of challenges that you know how to behave and you will behave the way you choose to behave. So if you want to choose to do these certain things, that's entirely uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a strong ring. It is entirely your choice and that is – it's like having a daily routine or something like that. Somehow having more structure in your life gives you more freedom. Mm. Having gone through these kinds of challenges to know yourself, it, it does, it takes nothing away from you. You have everything to gain. Yeah. From. Sorry. And I think I, I didn't quite finish my thought, but the discipline that you have to have to actually put things in place to, to tackle you gain the time. thing you, you gain time that like you've observed. You yeah. think there's a good saying like, uh, if you're too busy to meditate for an hour a day, you should be meditating two hours a day. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Time takes on a funny function when you really are diligent about these things. Um, and I'm, I'm not currently, so I've, I've no, gone no, away. No, me from neither, it. full disclosure. <laughs> yeah. I, I came back to it f- recently yeah, yeah. for quite well for a couple of months and then I fell out of it again. And yeah. I, I recently... You seem to go through phases like that too. Yeah. Yeah. But you have less time when you are less disciplined. Yeah. And so you gain freedom, you gain knowledge, you gain self-knowledge, you gain so much about yourself. Um, so, yeah, if you... Yeah, I... There's no reason not to start. If you're contemplating it and you're afraid, there's no reason not to. Yeah. Well, I just think, I think about like when I'm, when I can, when I can consciously acknowledge avoiding being by myself or like having, having time to think it's generally because there's something that I know I'm going to have to address at some Mm. point, but I don't want to think about it yet. So I want to stay unconscious, whatever you call it, to not deal with that thing. And I guess like if you're working towards setting up your situation or environment to, to make hopeful that there's less of those things that you don't want to think about, maybe you're then in a position to spend the time on, on self. But yeah, like I, I, I don't know, like I find it really difficult and I know I've been really lucky with a lot of the things that have gone my way in life. I just imagine how hard it would be for people in, in I guess, worse situations. But then like it just seems so simple though at the same time. Well, you, you, you're going to have to address it at one point. If you never address it, you're never going to fix it or improve yourself. And you're going to always be in that situation. You, you're never going to have a better you, – you, you might expect that things get better or hope that something's going to happen for you, but it's up to you to put yourself in that position for that to, to happen. Yeah, you've got to repair your trauma somehow, which means diagnosing what it is and figuring out how to fix it. And it's easier to avoid doing that, just like it's easier to avoid going to the gym or yeah. eating a healthy diet. You know, it's yeah. just, it's a mindset and it's a confronting one and it requires a shift. And But like Regan says, I mean, you could do what we did, a 10-day Vipassana meditation with no objective or aim or any intention of anything beyond that, and it would be transformative. Yeah. You don't need to be well prepared for these things, no. except for psychologically, just say you're committed to it. Like you're not leaving, and they yeah. will actively discourage you from leaving, and people try and leave. No, they're not trying to run out the gate, but yeah. but they'll go to the teachers. There's one opportunity a day to speak to a teacher if you have something that you need to so. say or something that you you need to resolve about your practice or something, but... People go there all the time and say, yeah, look, uh, I can't do this. Uh, you know, I need to leave. And and they get talked out of it. And then they're always glad. You're, you're supported as yeah, well. You it's are. not cultish. But, no, uh, no, it's not. No. The reason being, and they describe it very well with an analogy to surgery. You know, if you if you start undergoing surgery. You can't then, pull out of it. Exactly. You've got yeah. to commit. And, and effectively, it is what you're doing. It's self-surgery on the mind. I, like I love also like you, they have come and the people that are obviously running the place know that these people have consciously at one point decided to commit to this 10 days. So it's in their best interest, exactly. obviously for the individual to And they ask them. you at each point when you yeah. sign up, when you're there and then before you start, you, you are trying to make a commitment to yourself. So they're just helping you honor that basically. 
Um, because the reason you made a conscious choice to come there is exactly what would tear you apart if you left halfway through a surgery and you had made the problem worse. But, and, you know, there is this sort of pop psychology idea that meditation is somehow some pill you can take, you, you close your eyes 20 minutes a day, and then you never have to stress or have anxiety mm-hmm. again. It's like, it's the exact opposite of that. It's saying, you're going to sit there with your anxiety for 14 hours a day or, you know, 12 hours a day of active meditation plus these extra little times. Um, so it is, a, it is a facing those challenges rather than some, you know, pill you can take. Yeah. It's, it's not to just dampen those. It's to make them louder. Yeah. And I guess that's the other reason as to why it's easy to choose not to do that, right? Because it's a bloody hard road ahead. It, it, oh, man. Like if you've made mistakes, if there's things that you regret, like like we all have. But you're not right? necessarily going to. Well, yeah, I mean, and 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 that's you know, if you need to confront that, you need to confront that, or everybody does in their own way. But that's yeah. not necessarily going to come up with a. Mm, it's a, surprising. Uh, what you think is your block may not be your block. Yeah, you know? yeah. Okay. Like, and the things that it's not predictable. The experiences that you might have inside your own mind may have nothing. Like you may struggle to connect them at all to. Mm to why they might be occurring, you, you know. Because remember, as you said, you know, you struggle with, or, as in we all do in today's day and age with like addiction to the yeah. the technology, you know, these phones constantly available. So we think going in that we're going to have to <laughs> deal with uh, really deep problems about, you know, all this thing that happened in my childhood on yeah, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. When actually the things that you have to deal with are, you know, are you making the most out of your day? Like now that you don't have technology around you, what are you free to do? Like how does your mind behave when you've deprived yourself of as much food as you would normally eat? You know, so you're now actually dealing with hunger. And despite it being a meditation retreat, you don't actually get as much sleep as you might think. So you're dealing with tiredness, hunger, you know, the fact that you don't have your basic amenities around you. Yeah. So you think you're doing this other work, but you're actually doing the base level work, but it turns out that's the real work. The yeah. thing that is preventing you from dealing with your own problems is the stuff that you're not doing in the day, right? And so when this is organized for you and you can, that's the kind of thing that comes up. Now, not to say that you don't do that other deep kind of work where you know people do have massive breakthroughs about relationships or past trauma or things like that. Absolutely, it happens. Yeah. But I think as Tony's iterated well, is that going there without that mindset is, is actually very helpful. Because that partly is its own problem that you've come with some goal if you just relax into it. And and they guide you. That's the other thing is you're completely guided through every part of this so that you all you have to do is just be there and just try and just commit. That's it. It's, it's really cool. It's really cool to th- hear more about what those retreats are like. Like I've heard of Vipassana. I've uh, like looked into it a little bit. I haven't really paid it much thought. But to learn about your experiences, it's – um yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, just to be clear as well, we're strictly speaking about the passion. There's no end of meditation retreats and other yeah. treats, retreats of uh, of various descriptions promising right. various things. But right. the passion is a long established global tradition which uses the same template all over the world and always has. Um and so it follows a pattern no matter where you do it, it's always the same everywhere. Yes, that's true. Um so we can only speak to that experience. Right. It's um, just one type of all of the things. That yeah, are on there are it, other yeah. things that people could certainly do, and they may be beneficial or not. But you know, vipassana is its own particular journey. Yeah. Mm. What are some other things that people can do? I don't know. I haven't done them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably have. But yeah, yeah, there are a variety of things. If we put yeah. our mind to it, I'm sure we could yeah. figure out some trips. I'm sure you could. People can take. <laughs> we um, we'll talk about trips for sure. But let's talk about crypto. So okay. I, uh, we've got a Dogecoin millionaire in the, in the house. Round of applause, everyone. <laughs> the ABC, hard at it. Um, I've been lucky enough to learn a lot about crypto since meeting Regan, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. Bitcoin has plummeted. We're all broke. <laughs> like, what's going on? The whales moved. You know? yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I want to. Yeah, I want to hear. I want to talk a little bit about what your thoughts are with the Bitcoin drop. See if I, I agree or if I think the same way. And then I'd love to like learn a little bit more about NFTs and the other, like the out, outer skirts of what co- people commonly know about crypto. It'd be cool. I know you're, you've dabbled a little bit, Tony, so I'm sure you're there. Probably to the same degree you have. So. Yeah, really, yeah. I'll be the student here as well. <laughs> well let's go, Dr. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Bitcoin. So I found myself in an interesting situation that um, because I was a re- relatively early adopter, um, I kind of get informed by other people nowadays. Uh, I find out 
that things have happened. Like I didn't really understand NFTs very well for um for a long time. Yeah. Um, so my finger is not so much on the pulse the way it was back in the early days. So my my analysis is like anyone else's, but I think the main thing that I came to the understanding of is that Bitcoin. Like people ask, what is Bitcoin? Right? It's, trying to explain Bitcoin simply has been like the bane of <laughs> Bitcoin's existence, and I just came to the understanding that Bitcoin is money. Right? The simple answer is Bitcoin is money. The real question is, what is money? <laughs> okay, yeah, and then, yeah. then you've got all the same problems. I think problems. you linked like the what is currency video to our, our first chat. Oh, excellent. That is a very, yeah. very good it, it is dis- a great description video. and documentary. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so when I just started thinking of it like that, like you don't have to understand everything that goes into money to understand how to use and you know understand what money is and how it can benefit you. So I now just think of it like that. Like it's just money to me. Um, I have a diligent uh process for using it and storing it and you know um acquiring it but beyond that i don't pay attention to the market fluctuations because honestly everything fluctuates all the time and in fact one of the key principles of vipassana and the the insight meditation is that the only constant is change bitcoin is gonna drop bitcoin is gonna go up and bitcoin is gonna go sideways and that's just how it is um and just as with the meditation is like, yes, you have these peaks in life. Yes, you have these dips in life, the hard times, et cetera. And there are all those other times in between. So if you can just keep a steady mind throughout all of this, use it for your purpose, whatever that purpose is. I mean, for me, that's easy to say because it's the same purpose as having a savings account, right? Sure. So if you can just steady your mind as the Bitcoin goes up and down, when times are good, you know, do what you need to do with it. When times are not so good, make sure you're, you know, working hard and and keeping a, um, yeah, ha- having a good, steady um, set of behavioral principles that you operate by. And, you know, keep informed, but I don't keep my finger on the pulse because it sends you crazy, you know, saying so close to it. Yeah, I can imagine, like, you're looking at a figure one day yeah. and then looking that you've lost 10,000 fiat oh, currency the next yeah. day. Yeah, I'm sure it would be insane. But, yep. yeah, I've only adopted it somewhat as yourself, Tony, it sounds like. And that's what how I'm treating it as a savings account. I haven't stressed yeah. too much. Like, I believe I've listened to enough super smart people talk about how important this is to – be sold on it. I'm still obviously an absolute juvenile when it comes to crypto. But one question I got recently where I was doing lawn bowls for a birthday party on Saturday and we're talking about Bitcoin and just all the things you talk about at the pub with it, mm-hmm. having a beer. And he was like, well, what happens when the next person invents the next Bitcoin? What happens to the value of the first one? And I tried to very poorly explain that that can't happen bitcoin's perfect blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> it's decentralized yeah, yeah. no one oh, I swear, it. No, no, take all the seriously. buzzwords <laughs> yeah yeah all the buzzwords but but it was a really good question i was i was stuck and uh, yeah I, i'd love to ask you your thoughts on that okay question. so what's the specific question so it, it is like so what happens when someone in, invents the next bitcoin okay. what happens to the value of the i mean in a sense we've seen this happen how many thousands hundreds of, of times time, yeah, t- thousands of times by now um There are a couple of answers. Like one is that Bitcoin, as far as cryptocurrencies go, is like has the first mover advantage. It was circulating in as an economic value proposition well before people actually ascribed any value to it financially, right? So this is people who recognized the significance and they were rewarded for being able to see it for what it was. And similar, people who took the risk and adopted early and survived the disgraceful (laughs) sort of history Bitcoin has had through, you know, dark markets and Exchange is closing. So they were rewarded proportionally or lost out disproportionately yeah. to their um, investment. Yeah, to, to the rest of us, but they were pioneers, you know. The first one through the, through the door gets bloody, but they laid the groundwork. So for one aspect of the answer is that Bitcoin has the first mover advantage compared to every other cryptocurrency. So it will always have the most legitimate circulation based on merit, foresight, adoption, risk, etc., and then everyone else can still gain from the game theoretic aspects of if we all hold it, it the price is going to go up because it's a limited um, supply. You know, supply. Exactly. So we can all benefit from that and the hard work is done. But what happens when a better technology comes along? Well, in a lot of ways, Ethereum is a better technology. It's more programmable. It's more dynamic. It can be used as a base layer from any other technologies. Bitcoin can do it, actually, but Ethereum does it better. Sure. So Ethereum just takes over that niche. You know, now it's the the base layer for your decentralized applications. Uh, NFTs now have solved a similar problem, almost the reverse problem. 
Whereas Bitcoin is perfectly fungible, you have the opposite, where you have non-fungible tokens, so that each key you get is unique. That's serving its own function, its own niche. Um, so gold still has value. Gold holds its value, even though we've invented digital gold. So man, no one can see the future, and if it all collapses, well, it was doomed from the start. You know, the sun's <laughs> going to go supernova, so it was all doomed from the start. All right, it's a question of when and how. on top of each other before the sun goes supernova a few times. America's six months away from collapsing <laughs> yeah, on each other. Exactly. There are, there are certain cycles that are coming to an end as we speak, um, so... Yeah, but like, yeah, what, what do you believe in? Like, I, I believe that we are not headed into a future that we use less of the internet. So it makes well, sense. This is now this man's domain. A currency. We're, yeah, I mean, we're, well, like all of the. So Bitcoin, I think, can exist with or without, you know, it doesn't need any further technology to exist and, and will continue to exist and has also the advantage of being completely decentralized. And all of the other currencies have, go through a central exchange yeah, or central, yeah, 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 some sort of. And yeah. a lot of them, you know, are artificially market manipulated and there's all sorts of dodgy pre-mining mm. schemes and things like that going on. Um, so my analysis has always been that Bitcoin is in a different lane. It's a different asset type. It's more like buying land, mm. you know, and land in an area that's not yet really developed. Is it like buying gold or you reckon more land? I think it's more like buying gold is a gold stores value by agreement, if you like, but doesn't have much utility. Whereas Bitcoin has enormous utility okay. for a variety of different things as well as storing value. Like, like land. Yeah. So it ha- it's more like land to, as far as I can read it. Yeah. That makes and then sense to me. things like all the other cryptocurrencies and Ethereum and things like that um, work as currencies and then they do all sorts of other applications. But that the real potential of that is, is nowhere near being realized yet yeah. because that's what we're talking about. For a lot of that stuff to really come to fruition and, and start to take over in, in, in like as, as a volume of commerce. And it'll probably go a bit like e-commerce. Don't you remember that phrase, yeah. e-commerce? Mm. You know, mm. it's like, oh my goodness, people are buying on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> they could steal your yeah. details. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, maybe 10 years from now, like life in a quasi-digital world will be fairly common, for better or worse. Yeah. And all of these technologies will be way more functional in, in that space. Yeah. Whereas Bitcoin doesn't need that space to be functional. It will be functional in that space. It'll be functional outside that space. And it has a long, longer term st- strategic sure. advantage as well. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, like right now, I'm trying to learn about the other stuff, but I'm, I'm not putting enough time into it because I don't have enough time. I've figured out a strategy of sorts for me with Bitcoin, which satisfies my aims. And I, yep. and I think, you know, there's a lot of chatter in this topic as well and people just need to remember a simple binary you know are you like you're either trading currency um or or tokens or you're just purchasing them and holding them you can't do both really or you need a strategy yeah yeah yeah. so if you're purchasing and holding market fluctuations don't matter yeah Yeah, no honestly and it hasn't really mattered to me either for that exact reason but if you're pulling your hair out trading every day trying to make yeah we all know people who are pulling their hair out when it it goes down and not to say like we've had some conversations when it's (laughs) dipped at inopportune times and (laughs) there's some psychological sort of uh yeah yeah uh yeah, but you know it'll come, come it'll, it. it'll come back probably yeah. in time, you know, and if you're not desperate to... Exactly. You know, yeah. If you're not desperate to get out, and usually if you're not desperate to get out, if you can last six months, it'll recover. But yeah. people who are trying to, like, flip coins overnight or, you know, yeah. day to day, like, they could be ruined in a heartbeat. Mm. It, it, that just sounds terrifying to me. It's like gambling, right? Like, we all, we all take elements, so different levels of risk, and we all enjoy it at different levels, and some people love having a go and having a gamble, and if you can make a lot of money really quickly by picking the right tote, like the right coin, then Jesus, yeah. You or or still the, remember, the there. I think even a very... Um, so I, I have people who just, they put a set amount into like all the NFT space, all of that. And the thing is, if you hit the right thing, you, yeah. you can go 10x, yeah, 100x pretty easily. This space is still so unknown. So we, there's going to be a huge um, extinction event, let's just say. Uh, but then that will lead to a natural selection of things that really carry value. Um, but even still, even if most stuff goes to zero, if you're just a little bit strategic, as you're saying, if you just have a bit of a strategy around this stuff, you are in undiscovered territory. This is, as Tony was saying, it's it's real estate for an entire metaverse. <laughs> I don't like to use that term anymore, but, yeah. but effectively a whole new universe of possibilities has opened up. And so we just do not know where this can go. 
investing in that technology early. We like to think we're late on Bitcoin because it's 10 years on, but if you have a currency that is legitimately, it could be used as a universal currency if necessary. Like that's the reach of this thing um, is it, it investing early. It be is, printed more. Yeah. There's, there's not going to be more of it. It's going to exist yeah. on uh, on this playing field that we all play on. It and doesn't even need the internet. More. You know, you've got yeah. Bitcoin satellites and things like that. If there was a global internet outage, you could You're still... Kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's resilient even to that. Yeah. Um, but it also allows, you know, a form of alchemy. You, you know, if you become a Bitcoin miner, for example, you know, you can produce electricity to produce Bitcoin. So basically you're getting paid for producing mm. electricity somewhere where electricity wouldn't have previously been produced. And Yeah, the, the intelligence of places like um, El Salvador to use geothermal energy. So they can they basically have free energy in which they can mine currency. Yeah, so they're getting free coins for that. Yep, yeah, which then, as you're saying, it's like alchemical. They can mine something on a volcano or a vent somewhere yeah. and pull that value out of the air in a completely other location that has no natural resources, but they That's have crazy. available availability to a globally accepted currency like the, the implications of what this is are pretty profound and it's amazing you know once you've been in the space for a while the the levels of insights you tend to have and they come increasingly uh you know as you stay in the space because yeah. it's really profound technology one of the big insights that i had about bitcoin that I, i'm not sure if you had similar ones when you first started learning about it too was like the way I see the world going, I see more government control. I see less privacy. I see uh, fiat currency be- becoming worth less and less and less. So to know that I can invest my dollar into this thing that there's not going to be more of, it's that there's just that amount. It has all the, like the utility that you guys have just described. Uh, it's secure. It's lasted for 12 years. It's the first mover. It's all of these things that, add value and it's scarce so I, I was listening to a podcast and someone said one of the reasons why you know it's going to work is because it's scarce and humans love scarce things that's why we place value in gold because it's scarce and land. Exactly. and land yeah um so like that for me okay well i'm going to take uh 10 of what i earn every single fortnight and i'm going to put it away into something that i see long-term value in and I know that my money's better sitting there than in my bank account where it's becoming worth less every single day as the government prints more money. It, and, and another and, and privacy, sorry, as well, yeah. is the other thing in line with all of that is like, yeah, I, I don't do anything mm. too illegal, but to, mm, to that not, definition can be changed very yeah, quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and there's also very the, quickly. there's also the <laughs> argument about like why should you involuntarily have to be giving up your privacy? You right, know, you're entitled to a certain amount of privacy, and you're entitled yep. to have a private life and make private financial decisions, and not everything. So- do you Not everything so? should be automatically on the register, you know? Yeah. Well, when I say on the register, obviously it has to be on financial registers, but not everything has to be pinged to some government yes. database, you know? I, I think that some people, like young people especially, genuinely believe that's a, that's not a problem. No, they, uh, well, they, they don't. They don't see a problem in... But this, like, this goes back to sort of the conversation we were having before we started recording where we, I was saying that there's people who've been on Twitter for as long as yeah. it's been around now, which is 15 years. And so if you're 30 and you got on Twitter at 15, that's half your life on Twitter. That's pretty formative. Yeah. It's um, and, and effectively, it's not just that they are, you know, digital natives or, or whatever, or have seen the technology since its inception. There is an element to these technologies that are actively conditioning people. You know, they, they use the same reinforcement schedules as, you know, your poker machines. So, they are conditioning people to be dependent on them as well as you know, so addicted to them effectively for happiness, for social connection, for a variety of things. Um, so when the technology is telling them that you have to do X and they're addicted to it, they, have, they feel as though they have no choice but to do X. Um, and this is effectively what, as you spoke previously, towards authoritarian control and, and governmental you know, they're, they're changing their nature of their relationship with citizens. Um, the technology is playing a really important role because they're able to condition people to need government in certain ways. You know, there's always that sort of like financial through welfare, et cetera. That's been known and an accepted part of society. But this use of technology for people who have grown up on it and have had it sort of embedded into their development, you know, conditioned to it, and then now it's telling them what to do, that's where I think governments have realized the power of this technology. Um, and there is actually, it's probably important to say on the back of that, there is a way to get out of it as well, to not 
be so dependent on this. And Vipassana is an excellent example because when you take all these things away, effectively you start to decondition your mind. So in, the psychologists know about conditioning, how that works. This is the basis of psychology as a scientist, as a science. It's not a science without the science of conditioning. Sure. Um, and so this is really, really well worked out, how to condition people, how to condition animals, how, how to condition anything. And that's a primary function of the technology. But to, So we also know how to decondition, how to remove conditioning. Um, and meditation is almost the antidote to conditioning because – the very way you measure conditioning is in behavior change or active behavior. And what meditation does is impulse control. So if you have an impulse to do something, say you're addicted to smoking, say you're addicted to drinking, say you're addicted to your phone, when you meditate, you're not doing any of those things. You're controlling those impulses to engage in that behavior. So meditation is actually an antidote. There are many. Um, sensory deprivation tanks are another Um some kind of psychedelic experience is another. Um, so, yeah, there are not only these problems, but there are also these solutions and answers. And I think it's really important now that we're starting to become culturally very aware of these problems, and you've pointed out it's in the format of government control. I agree with you. Um, it's in the format of many things, depression, anxiety, you know, isolation, loneliness. Uh, but we we have certain solutions that are better than you know pharmaceutical drugs or more of it. And it's nice to see more and more research happening in in yeah. that space, especially as some states in the United States have started legalizing uh, psilocybin mushrooms, marijuana, yes. um, or at least decriminalizing them. It's allowed to be more like more heavily researched. I think I said on Sam's like on on my well, the chat with Sam last week that like it's crazy. Sorry to repeat myself, everyone, but. It's crazy that uh, like there, there is so much evidence to suggest that these experiences can be so great or so powerful, can help uh, medically, but also it can help just in terms of self-worth and, and contentness. The mechanisms right? are becoming pretty well yeah. known at the neuroscience so level well known. now. And, and, but there are still such a huge majority of people that hear someone talk about a psychedelic substance and be like, oh, that... Yeah, it's drugs. Do you have yeah, to... Doing drugs that, I mean, you also yeah. have to account for the fact that the vast majority of people are not interested in changing course right. for one reason or another. I mean, even to go back to the privacy thing, it's, it's, if you ever think about it, it's obvious that most people don't care about privacy because you've got an entire generation, maybe two generations at this point, who's, who have grown up happy to trade convenience for privacy and communication. And then you have a much older generation who don't really understand the privacy that they're giving up by mm -hmm. having devices. And there's this kind of middle wedge generation that, or maybe two generations that do get that, and only probably half of them or maybe a quarter of them are actually concerned. So across the citizenry, the deep worry about privacy and technology and government overreach in terms of looking into your life, most people don't feel that, I suspect. Um and so if you're not worried about privacy, then you're not alarmed by it. And, you know, you're probably not that alarmed by technology generally. And therefore you might have no real interest in the idea of unplugging or you might be, as you know, as Regan says, you could be conditioned to believe that all of this, you know, all these bells and whistles and convenience and these messages that you get is actually the most fulfilling way that humans have ever lived. Yeah. You know, and, and why would you want to simplify? This is great because now we're mainlining the world and all our friends at the same time. And, yeah. you know, this is... So a lot of it is a mindset. The ways out and the ways of decompressing and deconditioning are there. Yeah. Um, but, but as the, you the said, the willingness, resistance, you know, the willingness to change is not necessarily yes. there. And governments know that, so they know, and co and tech companies know it as well. They don't hide the fact that your privacy doesn't matter at all. To yeah. them. I mean, they're straight up about it, but they know that most people don't care. Yeah. Um, or if they do care they can't really avoid the technology. Well, that's right. If they just nudge you in the right direction, yeah. use this, the right prompts, the right, you know, uh, well, you can't use our technology that everybody else is using, this kind of uh, persuasion, yeah. or we'll censor you if you say the wrong thing. Yeah. Or, you know, there are so many ways that they know how to nudge you in the right direction. And this is, it seems uh, benign if you don't think about it, I suppose. <laughs> as soon as you start thinking about that, that becomes a pretty clear problem. Yeah. Well, you see the same problem with free speech. Well, like it's, exactly. It's, it's the where, exact same type of people that have never thought about it too deeply. Yeah, and, saying you don't care about it is basically admitting you have nothing to say. Yeah. Do you, um, sorry. I mean, the free speech one kind of, in a sense, mirrors the privacy thing because if privacy, if you're trading privacy con for convenience and connection, then with 
the free speech thing, you're sort of trading the capacity to reach an audience for the capacity to speak your truth. Yeah. Because yeah. the same technology that allows you to reach an audience um, is the same technology that will decide <laughs> whether yes. what you're saying is appropriate for an audience to hear. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's a, a, a total contradiction. That's and, and it's abused widely all the time. What was that? Um, you once gave a talk and... It was slightly on this topic, and you said something that I thought was really nice. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it was your turn of phrase, or at least it was a, an ad- adaptation of something Alexander Solzhenitsyn said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, um, yeah, you should. Is it the line? Or this, that, 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 that quote, the line that runs between um, the line between good and evil yeah. runs down the center of everyone's heart. Something it runs like down that. the heart of every person or every yeah. man, or something like that. And yeah. and and I had power. I changed that to the, the the line between good and evil runs runs down the center of every algorithm. And I think that's it's so perfectly encapsulates the problem with these things is that algorithms themselves are pure logic. You know, they are just logical. So the morality, we have to embed that morality into those algorithms. And if we don't, we will get this, you know, we've seen regimes and certain types of human historical events that have operated on pure logic that have led to absolutely devastating ethical um, problems and I, th- I thought the way you turned that phrase was perfect because not only does it run down our hearts, as Ox- Solzhenitsyn said, but we are then putting that into every algorithm. Yeah, we're we're shaping the algorithms ourselves, and the al- and and also there are you know the, the gatekeepers that are shaping the algorithms too that are programming them in the first instance to lean certain ways. And yes. uh, I mean, there were, like you know, there there have been like it's very hard to to kind of study anything. Um, controversial these days in the social sciences, but if you were brave enough to do, say, a study of online instances of racism, you'd probably find the results are the opposite to what the media would tell you that they are. Um, I believe these studies have been done. Well, they probably have been done. <laughs> and I think you're right. <laughs> and I think I'm right, found. right? I don't know what they are, so I yeah. won't cite them. They're, but they're, yeah, they're not often published in the literature, yeah, but there yeah. are ways of aggregating certain data so it can be explored by the And so for, so, for example... <laughs> use DuckDuckGo, guys. Yeah, well, do use DuckDuckGo. Um, for example, Facebook recently um, deployed an algorithm to um, sort of make an account of the types of racism that was happening across their platforms and who was perpetrating it against who and who the victims and the perpetrators were. And um, it came back and reported that like the vast majority of racist content on Facebook's platforms was directed at white people coming from black people. And Facebook pulled the algorithm. Of course. <laughs> because <laughs> it, yeah, it, 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 it didn't it, fit know, the narrative. It noticed the trend, yeah. but the trend doesn't fit the narrative, and therefore the algorithm has to be reprogrammed. Imagine now, them know? yeah, posting that, those findings. Like, they would just be torn to shreds for just, yeah, sharing some but data. But it's like, I mean, the, the data doesn't lie, right? Mm. But the tech companies have the power to manipulate the algorithms to the degree that, right. that, that the, the data ceases to have the the legitimacy, you know? And we see this kind of massaging across data at every level, you know. Um, I'm surprised it's, it's not white women or white men. Sorry to cut you off. I'm surprised white women or white men wasn't the, the big group. The like big as in the about. perpetrators? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, I, look, I don't know if it was a global search, but it was a search of certainly of the US. Right, sure. And I, I think, you know, the online discourse in North America is a little different. Um, yeah. And so it... it but um, yeah, that's, I don't know. that's fair but enough. Again, with that you think about history. that, Carl. You go, well, yeah, probably, it's probably it's mostly probably white men and white women. But you know, based on your own personal experience, because probably most yeah. you know white like, men like and white women, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but there's a lot of races out there who are like overtly racist towards other races, <laughs> and not nearly as sort of like uh, schooled in anti-racism as as Western sure. people are. Um, and again, when you take social media and the the vast span of the internet is actually more representative of humanity as a mass, and then you study that you'll find that it doesn't necessarily align all that well with the, 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 the comfortable narratives yeah. of certain industries. And the psychologists certainly have found this repeatedly throughout the history of psychology is that often our intuitions, on the one hand, like we have the ability to stereotype um, and often it's actually a very good guide to yeah. you know aggregating behavior and patterns, et cetera, because we are pattern recognition and, and, machines. And staying safe, right? Like, Well, we want to know the, uh, you know, if there is a certain danger in our environment, yeah. we want to have some relevant idea of the statistics of that danger we as need it's to relevant best to us. estimate how the people around us are going to behave to make sure that we're not in a bad environment you mentioned like feeling energy like that's a big part of that i reckon we feel when things are tense or whatever but you also like you need to sum people up like i know we don't need too much anymore because we've done a like a well the irony of job. these 
social media algorithms is that they specifically divide people up. I mean, if you look yeah. at the way that, you know, we've heard the term echo chambers endlessly almost since social media became a thing, they are dividing. And often we do it to ourselves. You know, we, we start liking and commenting and engaging with content that resonates with us in a good way or a bad way. Um, and so we get fed more of that. And then we uh, find communities who do the same thing. And then we find larger yeah. communities. And so we are dividing ourselves. And then and you have the Russian bots that take you further down a rabbit hole. It's an hole interesting, as well. uh, yeah, little rabbit hole. I, I was wondering actually about that. You know, the the basis of these algorithms is a, um, a process called a Markov process. This is a mathematical okay. um, uh, way of describing dynamic systems. So, like weather. Whether it goes from, say, rainy to sunny to cloudy and whatever. And it moves through these states, clearly identifiable states. And so Markov, I forget what his first name was, but was a Russian scientist or a Russian mathematician. And he wrote down the mathematics that describes dynamic processes as a Markov chain. That same process is what underpins these bots, you know, that can, you know, your predictive text on your phone. Yep. Right, it takes you know what your previous word was, assigns a probability that you'll say the next word, and then it feeds that up to you, right? And with this process, you can design relatively intelligent algorithms on social media, and so these bots effectively are Markov chains. So I don't know whether this is true. This is just my you know rabbit hole kind of thinking. But I had always wondered whether they were really really accurate in calling the Markov sorry, in calling them Russian bots, because they are. They're literally yeah. Markov <laughs> chains. And so the, the, even the if origin. an American authored it, you yeah, know, yeah. or a, you know, a Chinese person authored it, they are Russian bots because they are Markov chains. And we're still chains. not allowed to call it a China virus, but we're allowed to call them <laughs> Russian bots, aren't we? Well, yeah, well, again, that's more of it. If the virus came from Canada, it's 100% being called well, the Canada virus. Well, they did virus. that, didn't they? They had like the... Uh, you, you weren't allowed to call it China virus, but you were allowed to call it the UK British, variant. The UK variant. Yeah, the and UK you, variant. But then when it was in India, so it became Indian Delta. Delta. Yeah. Delta <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So they've, they've certainly... And then they skipped the G variant. <laughs> 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 oh, I thought that For was... For reasons nobody could <laughs> yes. possibly explain. Yeah. Could you imagine yeah. if we had escaped the China virus territory and then it became the G, <laughs> the G variant? Oh, yeah, well, clearly Christ. no one was going to go with that. So yeah. I think this is a good time. We have a quick break, guys. We'll, right. be, we'll be back. <laughs> okay, yeah. We'll be back. You were, saying, you were sharing with us, Regan, uh, like some work on the unconscious and conscious. Be happy to talk a little bit more about that. Um, just remind me where, we, where we left you, off. You, you mentioned that you said the name of the bloke, but I didn't. I didn't You're talking about John C. Lilly's work yes. with. Uh, I, I was thinking tank. John C. Riley. Yeah. yeah <laughs> like, it before. can't be John C. Riley, yeah. so I'm yeah. not going to say the name. It's his other career. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very different uh, thought styles between John C. Riley. Yeah, but you were saying like like that we can actually be conditioned. You alluded to it earlier. Yeah, but like the human mind can actually be conditioned, like to be all, like unconscious. I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that's probably not exactly how I'd put it. The the brain itself is designed to be conditioned because that's how we learn. We learn like that. All animals learn like that. All all organisms earn like earn. Ah learn like that uh, it's the process is conditioning which is just another way, word for learning really an association so we learn through association um, the sound of a bell can make it um, can be associated with a dog's dinner so that over time um, repeated pairings of the bell with the food cause salivation in the dog so that over time you just have to ring the bell the dog salivates so it produces a physiological response in us and this is um, just by association um, this means that any random association, a bell doesn't really have any particular significance. Anything can be associated with anything else and we can use it in order to like train behavior, train understanding. So the dog understands with it, when the bell is rung, dinner's coming. Okay, So the same basic process is present sure. in our brains. But where John C. Lilly's research is very, very interesting is that he used um, sensory deprivation tanks. Um, these are enclosed environments, pods in which, you know, there's no, um, no light, no sound, um, the water temperature. So you're floating in Epsom salts, uh, which are very dense. So you float, the water temperature is the same temperature as your body. And this effectively eliminates all sensory input. And that means that the only conscious experience you have is of the input or the, the previous input, you know, whatever is ever already in your brain before you um, went into the tank. And 
since we're conditioned through sensory stimuli, by taking away sensory stimuli, we can actually condition our own brain. Then we, we gain access to um, you know more of our internal consciousness, our thoughts, emotions, etc., and we start to be able to um, you know produce impulse control. And this brings the unconscious into the conscious. But what was really, really fascinating and also kind of terrifying about his work with the tanks, he used things like psychedelics, he used things like um, electro-stimulation on the brain, and he effectively showed that because the brain learns and can be conditioned um, and deconditioned, um, this means that there's kind of a, a problem that we all face, is that either we program ourselves so we have to decondition ourselves first, become aware of our programming and sort of write new code for us, develop better behaviors, um, better thought processes, patterns of life, patterns of thinking, etc. But if we don't do that process, then we're kind of conditioned by the things around us. So our phones are a good example, but everything conditions us in one way or another. But his research basically showed that with the tanks, with things like psychedelics, with technology, with electrostimulation, um, you can create a situation in which any individual can be controlled. Their brain can be controlled by another brain or you know, have push-button control over this brain. So um, the research was done in sort of the, the 60s, the Cold War era. This sounds like MKUltra. This is the basis of MKUltra. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Holy right. shit. Right. I was That's, thinking that uh, the first time you sort of mentioned like the LSD trials, right? The mind yeah. control. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, exactly. Okay, so MK Ultra is starting to be quite well known, but it's still sort of in that realm of CIA mysterium. You know, is it a conspiracy theory? Does it work? Well, I think it's pretty much established now. I think. Most, I think so. It's mostly it's, declassified. Well, the thing is, it's based on very basic principles mm. of the brain and learning. Who was the main actor in MK Ultra? Um, MK Ultra was. It was, I mean, it's a collection of knowledge that's CIA been built up over a very Yeah, I, I know it was but a it was, program. It yeah. was like CIA, like dark, kind of like sort of CIA off book. Yeah. A lot of it was dark money research. I just don't, I don't have a story of someone that was given LSD to give to his groupies to have these mind control trials. And I'm just trying to think of who that someone was. It was part of MK Ultra, obviously, not oh, yeah. the totality. They used it. to do much worse than that. I mean, they yeah, used, that's tip of the iceberg to, stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. used to give like kids massive doses of lsd and things like that wow. oh i mean it's just terrific it is. And, and it's it's there's so much associated with it um you know the stories of mk ultra and what it involved and what it the things they did and what they were trying to achieve and it's 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 worth a, a, a yeah, good look at it sounds you know? like it but it's pretty grueling stuff um but it's like regan says it's based on these principles and these principles still pertain now in terms of how that's exactly right. So even if you don't look into MK Ultra itself, because that's a rabbit hole that, you know, fair warning, it's like not safe for life kind of stuff. Um, but the principles anybody can understand. And John C. Lilly's work is a good gateway to that. And it's interesting because he was, you know, very much a, you know, very dedicated scientist, very logical, analytical, etc. But he, as a result of this work, he realized there's effectively two paths we can choose to go down. We can program ourselves, use these tools, use meditation, understand ourselves, understand our mind and make choices. Or there's that other path of someone, something, whatever is controlling and programming you. Um, so he actually used it as a sort of stepping stone to become a countercultural kind of guru. Um, he's now a symbol for free thought and f exploration of consciousness, etc. Like this, the float tanks are used with tremendous utility for They're all fantastic. kinds of things. Yeah. So... Um, this MK Ultra stuff, like go down in the, that rabbit hole if you want to be disturbed because it's yeah. the consequences are frightening, but it all comes directly out of his research. I mean, there's more tacked onto it for military purposes, but this, you know the basic science is there, and you can use it to your benefit. So it's worth looking into. I mean, you could probably distill this down to effectively like fill your own brain with content or have exactly. it filled for you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I completely understand that. Right, like um, when I consciously choose to look into something that I'm interested in versus when I'm just going to put chuck something on, you know, and it's unfortunately a lot more of the latter than the former right now. Just the, like I said, I go through cycles, right? Some, sometimes I'm feel like I'm really good and putting myself first and thinking about, uh, well, well meditating in a sense, like I, I don't necessarily sit down, cross my legs and close my eyes, but I spend a lot of time doing nothing. Basically. Contemplating. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Being 
myself. Um, I don't know if that's the same or, or different. Well, this is something I, I've been thinking about recently, um, and I think it is worthwhile um, distinguishing between certain types of contemplation. Like you've got self-inquiry. This is similar to like prayer, yeah. where you're kind of like asking questions. You're seeking answers. You're trying to communicate or have a dialogue, whether that's with yourself, with a higher being, with the universe, whatever. So there's that kind of stuff. And then there's sort of like the Vipassana, which is our main practice, which is um, simply just not thinking. It's about paying attention to your awareness, your body, your sensations, et cetera, which your mind naturally thinks. So that does come out, but it's, it's not that you're seeking or imagining or having mantras. So there's, it's worthwhile sort of distinguishing between these types of contemplative practices, but they all share that same basic concept where you're you're just trying to sort of gain knowledge about yourself the world you inhabit your mind whatever it is so they're similar and different i think what's really interesting about meditation you know this is um when one enters a proper state of meditation their brain waves change so you're and what is it there's four different brain wave frequencies or whatever this, it, this is the sort of you're awake the asleep and then there's one that's in between that you're meditating Yes, so, and you yes, and yeah. you have these. Um, uh, so there's a attention when, when you're attending to something. You have like these alpha brain waves, but then when you when you slow down, you go into the theta state, um, and that's around like seven hertz. I, I'm not a neurophysiologist, yeah, sure. so um, I it, can't remember how the bands the stack up. Yeah. But basically, what you said is correct. But meditation does seem to be this. It's sort of like it's not paying deep attention to something. So it's not like solving a logical problem or you know being on on yeah. your phone or something, but it's also not sleeping. You know, there's this, you're awake, you're aware. It's kind of like dreaming. Um, and this brainwave is very, it's like an open monitoring. You're just aware of what's around you and you then are much more creative. You're much more relaxed. Um, and in these states, this is where the, you know, profound contemplative experiences can happen. I mean, all states can do it, sure. um, but the quality seems to be very malleable. Yeah. Of what you experienced. Well, talk, talked about earlier, like putting yourself in a position to, for that opportunity to come to you. Like this, this is how I see that, right? Like it's you putting yourself in a position to actually think about, well, again, I'm going back to the thinking thing, but to detach yourself from this plan or this path that you're subconsciously on, like you get the chance to separate yourself from that for a little while, at least, uh, which makes sense as to why you might be able to think of more well, different avenues forward instead of the one that you're just on without having that break. Yeah, well, changing your context and environment will stimulate your thinking and break your yeah. your current patterns and things like that. I mean, taking a walk in nature will achieve the same thing. Yeah. I think that's why people love camping. Eh? That's why I love yeah. camping. I love. It's not like yeah. camping is you know necessarily easy or convenient or <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, there are other reasons why people want to do it yeah oh, of course the cost of doing it is not excessive to those reasons and it's like doing the meditation it's like it is a lot to do yeah it's not it's worth doing you know yeah well and we've come back to it right like this is the second time we sort of come up in this long conversation so it's obviously if it's important enough for you to place value on it and, and talk about it like I, I need to take that seriously hey uh, it, since we're on the subject, I, I, and I raised this with Regan before, I keep seeing content in certain corners of the internet where I'm known to wander um, because one has to go a little bit off reservation sometimes to extend the off imagination yeah. <laughs> and, and get outside the usual chokehold of, of internet curation. But there's a, there's, a, there's a community of people out there who think that meditation is demonic, right? Um, Almost, yeah. And they believe that, like, in meditating, you're inviting demonic presence and all this kind of oh, thing. Oh, like, literally. Yeah, literally. Like, there's, oh. there's actually some... I've kind of contemplated this and, and looked into the the research a bit on this. Like, um, you guys both know, but... I, so I was a neuroscientist in a consciousness lab. And so this afforded me certain freedom to explore my consciousness and these kinds of questions. Like, you know, the, the idea... Behind that question has some surprisingly decent grounding. In, yeah, that's in, the thing. I couldn't yeah. ignore the question. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a rabbit hole to think through. But what, what are your thoughts on it? Um, my thoughts were that um, because there's a physiological, like, okay, if you're going to take this, and I'm taking a theological response to this now, right? Um, in a sense, right? So 
in a theological response, let's assume, yeah, that 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 the, the world and all its its inhabitants, including people, were designed by God, right? The the God of the Bible, um, and he's in opposition to the devil of the Bible, and the devil and his demons are, are what you're inviting in by meditating, right? So we, as products of, of God, if we're meditating and we're inviting demons in. Um, then, in this, you know, that's kind of the lens that I looked at it. Is that what we're actually doing? And then I thought, well, there are physiological responses to meditating, like your brain waves change, and your generally your life improves, not disimproves, and your behavior modifies and improves, not gets worse, yeah. and you're less likely to resort to vices and sins and things like that. But I think what really swings it for me is the actual physiological response. So, to me, if you're to take the proposition that we're all designed by a divine hand then why would that divine hand have designed in a physiology that allows us to enter a state where we can commune more effectively with demons? Well, well, there is that. Right, so that's my take. He, uh, I, uh, I hear you, and I think what's interesting about that is the, um, the phones and the technology put us in a similar state of sort of hypnosis. And this is something that, again, is sort of off-pest for you know, your academics in psychology is that most of them reject these ideas of, of hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming, um, mind control, brain control. The, You're saying the that neuro- most psychology sort of... Most people in psychology and academia... Most academics discredit, are not, not aware imaginative of, people. Yes. Right, so they completely discredit those things. They don't think they about them. They yeah. just assume that they are oh. without credit. And they, oh, yes. right. so, so they kind of refuse to look at them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like their minds made up. So anything yeah. that's marginal like this, you know, and even the stuff that Riga's talking about isn't even that marginal, but the identity politics stuff and social science where I live, yeah. for example, is similar. You know, there's a... They stay in their lane there's a lot. There's, <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's some pretty yeah. pro- you know, clear boundaries and, yeah. and there are big costs to going outside those if in, through your inquiries, yeah. you know? Yeah. But the, so the, the states we go into in meditation are... Similar to the states we can go in if we want to hypnotize ourselves. And this is similar to the states we go into if we are watching TV. And the technology does it as well. And all of these states are making ourselves very receptive. Very receptive to the influences of other, for lack of a better word, um, vibrations. And I think that's probably the appropriate way to look at it. Since we're talking about brainwave states, we're looking at frequencies. And frequencies is the signature of something that vibrates. So when you're when you're at this vibratory state, it's like um, I don't know if you've ever seen these. Like you can flick a tuning fork, you know that yeah, how you yeah. tune like a guitar or something. They vibrate. It vibrates at yeah. a particular frequency. Sure. And if you hold another tuning fork near it, it will have a sympathetic response. So that this one that you started vibrating then makes this one vibrate if it's tuned to the same frequency. Um, frequency exactly. And so what happens is that when we go into these hypnagogic states similar to before we enter a dream state we are open to certain kinds of influences so i think you're right in how you've diagnosed meditation that you are influencing your own mind your own brain and this is what john c Lilly was talking about um but when you enter into those brain states but you are not sort of protecting yourself in a way meditation protects you from demonic influences and demonic if we just look at it in a secular view um, there's a theologic view and there's a secular view let's just say um, other people's will other people's influence or influence of external forces right and often if someone wants to manipulate you it's for their benefit and not yours that's kind of the definition right so if you if you genuinely care for someone you're not trying to manipulate them so you're opening yourself up to manipulation conditioning um, in meditation, you're protecting yourself because you're actually you're closing off the external influences. But when you're in these other states, like you've got a main line through a phone to some, you know, everybody in the world through some, you know, social media or, you know, these algorithms that are not serving purpose for you but for somebody else, now you are indeed in that meditative state, the right brain waves, and you have external influences to which you're very receptive. So in a sense, I think it's a really great question. I have thought about it a lot myself. Um, yes, you are, in a sense, opening yourself up to, to these demonic forces. But remember, meditation, sensory deprivation, contemplation, prayer, all of these things are protective against them, yeah. whereas this open monitoring of the TV or the Facebook or whatever it is is saying, I don't care what you present me with, just show me something. I just want to be sort of like it's, entertained. It's so interesting to think of them 
as being in the same states have never made that mm. correlation before is when you're meditating or when you're just sucked into the TV, it's the same thing, except for when you're meditating, you're not getting whatever influence, whatever you're watching is throwing at you, right? I, I've never, yeah, made that correlation before. Yeah, and then this goes back to this MK Ultra stuff, which, you know, allegedly was the foundation of, mm. of if you like, mass programming of the population via TV programs. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> Which for a good fifty. Wow, eight, is that where is that where program comes from? The word I mean, programming. Right. And tonight's, tonight's, and tonight's programming involved. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly yeah, to the yeah. to the metaphor of frequency and vibration. You're programming the TV, and then you're tuning into the programming. Yeah, right. That's what you're doing, literally. And for fifty or sixty years, you didn't have any discretion really over the programming because there was no choice. real choice. Yeah. So you make that physiological sympathetic response in your body. That is resonant with the thing so, that is giving you vibrations, which is the, the box, right? So this potential problem of the masses being almost subconscious to that We are part influence. of the masses. It's yeah, very important. Uh, it's like that traffic analogy. It's like um, you're not yeah. in traffic. You are traffic. Yeah, so when yeah, we talk about right. masses, we well, are- I'm talking about, yeah, a current, like, uh, the current people are alive, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, so what about like people as little as 60 years ago that were before this constant- uh, before this world of where we're able to consume something all the time, every time, like, did they? I'm just trying to understand. Like, we we seen have so many problems in terms of climate, like culture. Part of me right now that like there's so many people that are in fights that are disagreeing. Maybe the internet is the thing that allowed this to happen. But do we always have this much trouble? as a, like a collective consciousness? Is it just a, a recent, I don't know, like I just see that maybe the radical people on the left and right that I see online is the people I'm referring to when I'm talking about right now. But I mean, it's the, in my mind it depends on definitions, but tribalism yeah. and sort of oh. othering and, you know, on the one hand of this kind of disagreement and tribal behavior, but also, you know, if you look through history, they're always talking about great conquests and wars and falls of civilizations and, yeah. Human history is absolutely filled with challenges, calamities. They just take different forms. Yeah, yeah, I guess I wasn't thinking. Like I was thinking about literally maybe the 1920s to 40. I guess the world wars were happening then. Exactly. I I mean, there have been significant changes, um, uh, particularly in in the second, from the second half of the 20th century. Um, And let's be clear, we're talking about if you like the Western world here, the English speaking yeah, world, because yeah. that's what we're all most familiar with. That's where we live. Yeah. Um, but there has been a sustained decline in religion, church attendance, the nuclear family has been in decline. Um, uh, stable lifetime jobs been in decline. The middle class has been in decline. Um, access to like reasonable housing at an affordable cost is in decline. The number of children born is in decline. Yep. You know, we're all being more and more atomized by a variety of shifting social forces. And we're, we're losing touch with an awful lot of what bound us together as a community. Like religion and going to church and, sure. and not traveling very far and knowing your neighborhood. And, and also there's things like women entering the workforce en masse because that changed the nature of of the suburbs because there was now there was nobody at home and the childcare industry was, yeah. was born, yeah. you know, and there's all of these. So all of this stuff is, and then on top of that, we have this main line of information. And even 20 years ago, that was overwhelming when you just had satellite TV. Um, but since then now we just are saturated in information. And so we don't, a lot of us don't really have much to cling to, in terms of, of, of meaningful social structures around us. If we're lucky, we have family and friends in some community, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. And then we're just constantly bombarded with low frequency, low vibration, low quality information and content that hooks you in whether you want it to or not, and it's very hard to, you know. And so we're, it's, we're just kind of in this permanent stress state, I think, where where we don't have anything to fall back on or anything to give us stability and the future looks very bleak for a lot of people. And and, and you, we have a lot of people. <laughs> it's like when even a small percentage of people can really shake up the whole game we're playing. Yeah, you know, yeah, we, we, yeah. We've got to be really careful about how we move forward as 
a culture, a collective. But the problem is we, we're not collective or a culture. We're like, we, we don't have, we, we don't consider ourselves to be that anymore. So you can't really have that conversation in a meaningful sense. Yeah, it's shifting I mean, away from like local culture, lo- local communities to now there's some sort of global consciousness emerging, but it's in its very, it's in its infancy. Yeah, but global consciousness, one thing nobody wants global, well, at least I don't want global government. Yeah, I, yes. I, I, I like there are nations. Two very, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like globalists. Um, yeah. And I, I do like nations. Um, yeah. And I like communities. Um, and I, you know, and I think people belong together in, in, you know, to a degree. And um, Well, we've got the, a built in sort of mechanism for this, uh, what's commonly called the Dunbar's number. Yeah, 150, is, isn't it? About 150 yeah. people. Can we keep relatively easy um, connection with, and usually these are the people, at least in our evolutionary history, who are directly around us, you know? And even organizations, which are a collective of people. They're not necessarily neighbors or family, but if they grow over about 150 people, they start to have internal political issues that don't happen below 150 people. And they often either have to become this very strict hierarchy with you know, bloated HR departments and other um, you know, uh, uh, stratifications that bloat the enterprise, or they have to become smaller you know, little communities, different franchisees, etc., but uh, yeah, to your point, certainly globalism as a sort of an ideology and a governance structure, I do not agree with. But and as a consciousness, like a planetary consciousness. Well, that's the thing. I think the planetary consciousness is growing out of this malaise and this yes. sense that like we are, I mean, you can be really fundamental about this um, and you'll see this said a lot on the internet and there's merit to it, whether or not you're actually a believer, but basically like we live in a world without God now. And that's why we're saturated in degeneracy and unhappiness, you know, because without God, you have no moral compass. And if you have no moral compass, you're not really part of anything and you don't represent anything. And that will cause a society to collapse. And in a sense, that's sort of what the, the Western Christian society is going through. And, and, and we are, and then social media and things like that have, have allowed you to see the most abhorrent things and, you know, be witness to degeneracy beyond imagination. And half the time you're told to take this as a good thing, you know, um, and so it's a lot for people to take on. It's no bloody wonder people are so unhappy. Mm. Uh, but we sort of lost that maturity or that sense of, of unity that would allow us to have a, a conversation um, to find a way out of it in many ways. I think Regan's dead right. You know, 150 people at a time would definitely find a way out of this. But when you, you, know, you zoom out to 25 million in Australia or, you know, 350 million in the US or, you know, we're in so far now that, like, it's very hard now to know how we... How we don't balkanize. Like, yeah. frankly, it's not... Some of the lines in the sand are, well, it's lines in the cement at this point. They're very deep divisions. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've seen that. And you mentioned, and I think you're right, that it's taken on a different quality, a different form. You know, these are... Now we have people who conglomerate around a single idea, and it can be so niche, this idea, about maybe a gaming community or whatever, and they can be 25 million strong, maybe 100 million strong, you know? These are the size of entire nations that have organized under a single symbol of some kind. So there are unique aspects to this. So I certainly, um, I certainly take that view that it's unique in some respects, but, um, and, and that's kind of what you're arguing as well, but there's also, you know, human cyclic history is cyclical and all of the points you made, you know, this, this loss of religious identity in the case of the Christian West, but, that same sort of idea of loss of your God or loss of your culture or spirituality or whatever it is that binds that group, when that is lost, almost without fail, you see a culture decline and collapse. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have all the we have all the patterns of it in the West, you know, which I say not trying to be provocative or anything. It's just, if you want to look at the patterns. They are there to be there. observed, yes. And and like one of the one of the or some of the indicators of a decline of a society, it's a serious a serious decline of a, a fatal um, decline of a society or a civilization. Um, and by the way, they, most civilizations end up, as, as Douglas Murray points out, end up committing suicide rather yeah. than... Yes, it's, um, a, it's a division within the self, yeah. as the so, Bible sa- states, and yeah. is that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And this so, scales to literally a house down to a person. If you're divided against yourself, yeah. then you, you fail, so and scales up to nations. And You have, you, have um, you know, a kind of Western civilization which is losing a belief in itself, mm. And then you have a celebration of all kinds of marginal, you know, niche lifestyles and things like that. And, you know, that's all marvelous and how wonderful that we're all so progressive. But again, that, that 
is usually symptomatic of the t- decline of a society, uh, a large loss of religion um, and, and religious belief and common religious belief. That's another disruptive force. And then um, and constant the pressure, yeah, a decline in the family and constant pressure from outsiders, whether it's like old school invaders 2,000 years ago or whether it's like sustained waves of immigration into Europe, for example. All of those things are destabilizing. Right? I would even argue and you can look at those dispassionately. I'm not making some kind of, I'm not ginning up some like racist argument yeah. here, but like there's a level after which immigration cannot be absorbed in, in places and it's, it's obviously, it's, it's contextual, but you look at the West and all of those things are happening there, you know, huge amounts of migration into the West, a decline in, in family and religion, um, an increase in these niche, niche, niche lifestyles and, and, and progressivism and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, uh, and a loss we, of culture, loss so, of culture, identifying. loss of faith in the culture and the uh, and the society, and and an increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots, or the haves and everybody else, mm. and and no kind of vision or you know no, no clear vision for how you go forward. And so, in a sense, you know, you end up in a, a reset, yeah, <laughs> a great reset, a, a great in... reset of sorts. Perhaps <laughs> mm, that might sort everything out yeah, but... <laughs> on a short timeline. Yeah. If only mm. we didn't like private property so much. Oh. <laughs> That Those is, few who have it. Uh, yeah, well, the, you know, a few, you know, even my small holding, I'd like to keep her <laughs> yeah. Schwab. <laughs> I, um, that is terrifying. It, like, it's... It doesn't have... Okay. No, no, yeah, I, know, I know it doesn't like, have to be. I know... <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be. I know, I know it doesn't have to be, but it's just like it's, that... It, there are a lot of very valid patterns. points all in a row, yeah. you know? Yeah, like yeah. That, that, is, that is scary to think about. You but, know what? Well, yeah. It's like, you know, and, and I'm no, no expert in this, right? At all. So let me be very, you know, clear that yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm talking in very rudimentary terms, but like one of the foundational principles of... Regan's alluded this to... This is not one, an education one show. One of the foundational sorry. principles of Aboriginal thought is pattern recognition over sustained periods of time like many thousands of years yeah. thing you know, the pattern will repeat so zoom out and look at where you are in the pattern yeah and you apply the same thinking to western civilization and the decline of other major civilizations historically and it is fairly clear that we're past the peak yeah so just past the peak i i would say in the start of the acceleration phase yeah now so like and i don't mean to yeah, yeah. Heaven, yes, 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 yes. but the question is, what next? Well, like, yeah, yeah. where do you think? It, where do you it think? It can things? be to some degree described with well, reasonable accuracy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, well, well, we can, we can, we can all we can really talk about it. Well, where do you go next in terms of like we can scenario sure, sure. it? You know, if, if we're on the same. Like, path. so what are the what are some of the patterns? Right, a pattern towards more digital immersion, including probably currency, which will eventually probably lead to a push for a single world currency. Right, mm-hmm. that'll. Bitcoin. be a basis for a single world government. There's going to be, a de- <laughs> you know, potentially a decline in nations or nations amalgamating. You could have a balkanization of the United States. When I spoke about balkanization five minutes ago, I wasn't, I didn't finish my thought. So it sounded, you know, provocative and controversial, but I, I feel like the U S could go that way. Could yeah. balkanize. And then um, you have a global credit problem that looks beyond resolution without just walking away from it. Um, and the great reset in part is based <laughs> on that idea. Right. Um, you know, so that all these are ways forward or, you know, or, or we can go into a more technological society with more surveillance and universal basic incomes and all. So all of these things, like basically we're sort of at a point now where we're at an interesting inflection point because Western civilization is past its peak and in decline, right? Um, Eastern civilization is sort of on the up, but has by and large is mimicking Western capitalist civilization. So we'll, we'll invariably follow suit um, just probably a little bit later. So the, 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 that model is not really sustainable in a sense into the future. So the question now is what comes next? And, and, and this is all happening at the same time. We have all these technologies like the blockchain and the metaverse and cryptos and all these things that are coming in, all with this enormous philosophical implication um, or question, which is like, and, and things like smart cities, which I've talked about as well. And, you know, we're at a point now where we, we get in a sense to, we should get to um, have some say in, in, whether we're creating a dystopia or a utopia, because there's an awful lot of factors that are kind of coming together right now. And one of the things that happens when cultures or civilizations collapse is that they can either sort of collapse internally, which means there's sort of an extinction event, but also what can happen is that another culture supplants that right. culture. So that China, in an opportunistic sense, as one culture is in decline, another can move in. And in fact, what has been known to be done, even in fact the United States has done this regularly, is... Uh, de- destabilize a culture, sure. allow it to collapse itself, and then move in. So, 
<laughs> so that's the kind of situation we're in. Not not to say that we can read the future and we know exactly how it's going to happen. Just that there's a there's a set of probabilities and possibilities that are more or less likely. Um, but what does seem to be obvious is that, as Tony was saying, all the signs of collapse are present. Um, it, I think anybody who looks at it honestly can suggest that you know there are some things that have changed and gone a little bit downhill over the last little while. And uh, the, the question of what happens next really is a question of choice. And this, I think, even comes back to the idea of you know the meditation, conditioning yourself or being conditioned is that we get to choose what comes next. So we've got to be really, really careful what we choose right now. You know, there are some situations in a system, a dynamic system. Um, this could be like a, imagine you're in a forest. It's full of food. It doesn't really matter what you choose to do with that food. You can kind of eat to your heart's content. You just can't exhaust the resources around you. And then there are other situations where if you don't conserve food and water, if you're in a desert, for example, if you don't make intelligent choices, the certainty is that you will die, right? So this is a time where, and even almost literally, we've got, we've got a lot of problems that like, you know, ecological destruction is a problem. It's also a symptom of other things that are similar to the Western decline. But the point is that if we choose intelligently, and that comes down to, you know, the, the this line runs across each of our hearts. We each as individuals, if we choose intelligently how to behave during this decline period, um, we can make something that is much better. But if we choose convenience continuously, and if we choose to be told what to do all the time, then there is a system waiting to be ushered in on the back of this decline. And this is what things like the Great Reset and you know certain aspects of authoritarian takeovers are about. And they're trying to help destabilize this process so that we choose the convenient option of upgrading to, you know, Upgrading sure. to social credit systems, right? Problem, reaction, solution. Yes. It's well known in the Hegelian dialectic that you create or notice a problem and facilitate it. You've got a book, The Art of War, on your on your shelf. These, these ideas have been around for many, 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 many generations. Okay? This is not new territory. Um, and there are people who can see these signs, and not only can they see them, but they can use them to benefit themselves. So we have to do the same. We've got to choose really intelligently how we move on at this really, really important time. And so the natural process of centralization, as we're seeing with things like government, power, money, etc., it begs a decentralization process because this is like a yin and yang situation. Dynamic systems always are in balance one way or another. Whatever we're going through now, It seems very unbalanced, but it's going to come back into balance one way or another. Now, that can be in balance of a very dark, dystopian future, or we can choose to have a balanced and um, enlightened, conscious, aware group of people inhabiting this planet who try to actively create a better planet for themselves, each other, etc. And that's our choice. I, I believe fundamentally, personally, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to believe or a spirit or a religious thing, but I think it's, it's addressing that we do get to choose because when you think you don't have a choice, that's the perfect scenario. You are a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. Something will fill that vacuum. If you're a vacuum of free will, someone's going to use your mind and your body and your brain and your experiences to enact things that benefit them. So benefit yourself, make good choices. That was beautiful, bro. That was that was really well said. It made me think of like JP has a thing about you needing to work on yourself before you try and fix the world, and mm. like I, I guess the uh, like the way that any single person can help like this cause, whatever this cause is. It's a it, it because it's so wide scale and large scale. It's hard to take seriously for me. Like it's hard to contextualize to how important it is. It just it's just a, a big. It's a completely different perspective to where, like, I, I see wiring signs, but I guess, like, I don't have the understanding or the knowledge of history to know how potentially catastrophic these signs are. I forget where I was going with that. <laughs> yeah.
as a society? Well, Regan was saying we, we can definitely choose to be better. But also, you know, extinction events in Earth's evolutionary history have been the fertile ground for natural selection to go up this new um, uh, evolutionary, uh, you know, go up another level, you know. We are at the brink of a, an extinction event in multiple ways at the cultural level, you know, even ecological level. We are at the brink of an extinction event. The, there is so much division that there is something is going to change. And when it does, it's going to change quite rapidly. And that's when that does, there's going to be a completely different set of norms and whatever evolve. It just, it, it's going to happen. So um, it will be the fertile ground from which we build. But we can kind of choose whether we start planting seeds and a forest or whether we just sort of rape everything and, you know, end up in a desert wandering for 40 years, you know. You know, like, <laughs> we can sort of, like, spin out on this a little bit, and maybe we should just for fun. But Yeah, it could be fun. Um, like, you think about, okay, so you can actually take the whole last two years basically as analogous to a civilizational collapse. Like, what basically civilization f- effectively collapsed for most people in terms of, like, yeah, that's fair enough. shifted into this way of living that was completely unimaginable. And and now, two years later, we've we've, we've traveled a great distance in that time, and sort of had ups and downs and a great deal of change and, and fight back and push back. And, um, and so, you know, there were a few things we could certainly see. One is that when there's a collapse, people will do whatever they're told initially first, if they think it's, you know, a civic minded thing to do. If you go back to the start of the kind of pandemic, it was like, everybody needs to do this and we're all doing it for each other. And everybody was really civic minded about it. And then people started getting less like that. And then over time, people started getting more agitated and some people got more, compliant and yeah. you know and then these factions formed and uh and and it looked for a while like there'd be no end to it and then this omicron thing comes along to it that comes along and effectively is an exit if we want it to be and and if, if we just recognize yeah, it for what just, it is and and now we're sort of on the way out of this and you know the international airline industry wants to get back to business and of course governments want borders open and so you know but what we can now do is we can look back at that behavioral cycle over two years because that's as close as this generation has ever come to a real full-on collapse right other generations had things like world wars which were collapses for them yeah. depressions in the 1930s the global depression for example even the gfc wasn't as formative as what we just went through um i mean i lived through some of it in europe but it was way worse than it was here but but still it wasn't comparable so you know we can but what's interesting i think is people went from uh compliance you know panic and compliance at the start of the collapse to less and less compliance um even though governments were pushing more and more for compliance and then by the end people were a lot of people weren't just complying they were also kind of going no this whole thing just doesn't smell right you know i'm going to look into this and and suddenly started realizing that you know it didn't all add up very well and and actually hang on now a minute and some of the things that you promised and I believed in good faith. And so there's been a lot of lessons learned, I think. So people are yeah. burned by this now. There's, there's always this dynamic balance as well, that as, as more information and direction of, say, you know, governments wanting to take more control over the behavior of citizens, yeah. there was, as you say, that initial compliance, but then it, it was the breadth, breath, it bred, <laughs> uh, you know, new channels of communication. Like for me, that was the, the, incentive I needed to get off social media entirely. And so now all my communication is either as much as I can face-to-face, um, but also very direct contact with the people that I want to do. And I sort of I, I sort of peer into certain channels of communication and I'm just seeing the fertile ground outside of, you know, what you might call the mainstream types of yeah. aggregators. Um, it's created this decentralization process. Yep. And we saw how Bitcoin went from, you know, it did 10x over the over that period nfts have gone insane like all of that that sort of that like that that upward that 10x up you could say is is mirrored by a 10x down in terms of people's trust in the media and right. politicians oh yeah we've never seen the less global trust. elite and the pharmaceutical yeah. industry that and makes so, so much sense you know so yeah i mean people are not nearly as naive as they were two years ago yeah. about the nature of the world i mean in a sense that all of this has been a reminder that we're basically just animals living in a jungle together yeah. you know? and when go you know and certain animals sure. are bigger than you yeah. they'll try and use and we're the only ones that need toilet paper and so when the shit hits the fan everyone's <laughs> like 
But you know, just like what's important is oh, yeah. and, and, no. I mean, like I, 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 he's he's right. You know, that's that's also a primal behavior. You know, I mean, if I'm going to have to die of a deadly virus, I at least want to clean back. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. but, uh, <laughs> at least right till the end. Um, yeah. But uh, but never then thought about it. You, you, you have so you know, if you look at what kind of came in on top of this, like this this creeping great reset thing, you know, with like creepy old Uncle Klaus and uh, you know, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy and the coronavirus is a good sign that we have to completely change the world and here's my pattern you know mm. and he's like yeah not only change the world but change it to this and it's, it's like, like mm. yeah <laughs> I, I hang on are you trying climate change in there as well you know yeah. uh, anything else you'd like to oh, own social like justice yeah yeah sure. <laughs> anything else you'd like to add into the formula you know and it's like none of these things are really connected and they're definitely not connected the way you think they are and all you're doing is coming up with these kind of you know, these, these, these fancy flowery ways of telling us that you have a plan that you're trying to steer us all into, you know? Um, but I think they overplayed their hand with the coronavirus stuff and people are not nearly as willing to be compliant yeah. or unquestioning going forward yeah. as they might have otherwise been. Um, so we might have an opportunity, Glenn, to be more sober and positive about this because we're not kind of running headlong into the... Into well, that, that's headline. exactly why I maintain optimism, despite, you know, I have tried to um, be uh, assertive in my view on how much freedom we should retain as individuals. And I think it's a lot more than (laughs) some of the conversations have agreed, but um, I do maintain optimism overall because as a result of this pressure on society, um, the people who were, it's like the development of Bitcoin. It came out of a broken fiat system. Yeah. And you had people like cryptographers who not only could see the problem, but were able to develop a solution. And that solution is world changing. In a similar way, we're going away from centralized sources of information. Governments in their authoritarian sense are becoming less and less relevant. Community, face-to-face, you know, these things are becoming more and more important for the people who want them, which yeah. means that these are being built from the ground up at a grassroots level mm. all over the world. And there is, there are tons of people like this. But there are a huge mass of people that don't want to engage in that and they want to be told and controlled. Yes. And, and that's perfectly fine for them, but there, it is going to come to a head at some point, at yeah, some true. level. I don't know exactly how. Yeah, and how, how that all plays out will be super interesting. Yeah, And yeah. hopefully, you know, it's as simple as a bit of a... We agree to disagree and, um, you know, choice, and I'm, I'm big on the idea of human choice, um, is that you don't have to be a scholar or a doctor to determine what is put into your body. Right. For instance, you know, as soon as the questions come around to those types of questions um, where it is about what happens with your body, with your mind, etc., then you don't need to be an expert on anything except what you – how you feel about that particular thing. You don't, because now it's a question of your involvement in a group rather than a medical question or whatever. So, and these are the questions that we're revisiting. Now there's obviously division on that, but when we allow for the possibility of choice and of freedom, um, then we have er- basically the, the most fertile ingredient for starting, you know, new ways of living that's not, you know, Uncle Schwab's <laughs> worldview. Um, the bugs live in the pod. Yeah, yeah that's right. I yeah. won't be doing either. Yeah, it it sparks the opportunity yeah. for creativity for for people to stand up and it does. And it provides exactly provides the right something amount to of the world that yep. that's obviously wanted and needed. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you know, you often get great cultural products coming out of recessions, for example. Yeah. Sure. And great art coming out of trauma, and great yeah. music coming out of anguish, and so as. Doom and gloom as some of these things can sound at first glance, you know, looking at the reality of things. And I think this is something that you learn by meditating is that you have to first look at reality, even if that reality seems depressing, because actually oftentimes it isn't. It's an opportunity to become stronger. It's an opportunity to become more competent, to transcend certain ways of being that were keeping you limited. And so it's actually a very optimistic story because we now, each of us, have the challenge but also chance to become the best versions of ourselves and do that at a global scale, grassroots movement, all over the place in a decentralized fashion. And it's happening. That's the other thing. It's actually happening. Yeah, it's 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 quite interesting if you think about, you know, we do have these technologies now at exactly the right time and they can be, we can use them really yeah. well or we can misuse them completely, but Bitcoin particularly, but also the other cryptos, the blockchain, um, 
decentralized finance. Yeah, sharing sharing knowledge and yeah. these yeah. De- decentralized apps yeah. can act as a finance as well as information transfer because mechanism. I, again, so much of the kind of globalist system and their plans for us all require centralization. Exactly. They're only scalable through centralization. Yeah. That's how they scale. Whereas a decentralized uh, uh, network can is highly adaptive, highly, highly sure. adaptive, and it is also scalable through decentralization. So we've got one kind of system is very pyramidal, very hierarchical, and it can only scale if the top dictates to the bottom. That's the only way it can expand and, and scale. Whereas the decentralized networks, they scale by each independent unit is adapting to its local environment, sharing back that information yeah. to the network and examining, evolving the solutions to certain problems and then overcoming them and sharing that information back. And so one is, <laughs> you know, you obey, you know, yeah. you comply. And another is let's find out how to solve a problem and then let's share that information. And I know which one I want to be a part of, to be perfectly honest. That makes but it's it's optimistic at, the, at its core. And it, it's already there. The technology is there. The mindset's there. The willingness is there. The conditions are there. The technology is always there, way ahead. Of, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the solutions are always there, far in advance of people really being willing to meaningfully engage with using them. You know, and using them correctly, because then you know that's the thing about these these devices is that, and it comes back to programming your own mind. Either yeah. you program it or someone else does. You use it correctly, or it uses you. And that's going to just be the problem is that the the power of these things is growing exponentially. So our ability to defend ourselves against it, sort of like a mental inoculation against the sort of the conditioning that comes from technology, has to advance. It has to evolve. And in a sense, I believe that is why we're seeing, you know, in opposition to the great reset, we're sort of seeing this great awakening. Yeah. You know? We're seeing people who are really taking these things seriously. And um the impetus for awakening and be con- being conscious means it's a battle for your mind, a battle for your soul, so that if you are up to the challenge of inoculating your mind against the influence of this kind of technology, you will live a conscious life because that is how you inoculate yourself. But if you choose not to and you choose to be controlled, then you live an unconscious life and you live a, a life in which you don't understand the reasons you do your behaviors or why culture or, or society tells you to do yeah. certain things. So you just have to comply. To exactly. So it's it's a choice, I think, between consciousness and unconsciousness. And what we choose at a planetary level and how we solve those yeah. problems will dictate our future. Well, I know, like, when I started, I think, taking my consciousness seriously, I notably became more accepting and happy and not as emotional. And, like, that. The, I, I, can, I notice, I see that change in my behavior. And uh, it... it when you do, when you boil it down to I just I guess self development or trying to better your own situation or life like there is so much that I've taken away from the things you've shared to make me take that time to myself seriously and hopefully I'm able to create a habit and stick to it and go back through the cycle again but I just um, that is something that every single one of us should take seriously is that well that you get to time. choose to either you yeah. take it seriously or you don't and yeah. Like well, not, uh, yeah, that's yeah, true, true. Sorry, choice. there yeah. are people that don't agree yeah. with what, what I'm saying and what we're saying. That's not important to them, and that's wild to me. I just, yeah. I don't understand that. How, and I guess that's where people are, have different opinions. But yeah, I mean, again, I said this earlier. You know, a lot of people don't want to do the work, yeah, yeah. or they don't recognize place. the need to consider doing the work, even yeah, which hard. is a step back again. You mm. know, yeah, um, yeah, it's yeah. a scary place in there, and like, it just, I mean. For some people, and I know people who have said this to me very overtly, like the idea of doing a Vipassana is completely outside of their yeah. realm of possibility. Like to them, being unable to, like being confined to a small space and being alone with your thoughts um, and not talking to people, making no contact, like it's kind of their version of hell. And I mean, I, I understand that. I get it. It, it, I get is, that too. it, it is confronting. Yeah. But at the same time, it's what's confronting is that you're confronting yourself, which means you're afraid of yourself. And uh, there's a lot that's been written by people like Carl Jung about facing yourself, integrating the shadow and overcoming, you know, these kinds of negative aspects of your personality and who you are. But at the end of the day, all that's lurking in the shadow is yourself. So what is in the shadow, what you sort of are afraid of is exactly what you need to overcome in order to become the best version of yourself. And honestly, you get there. It's not what you think it is. (laughs) 
Whatever you think it is, I guarantee you it's exactly not that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's something entirely new. But the prospect of going into the shadow, going into the dark, you know, and discovering yourself is scary because you don't know necessarily yeah, well, what the, you find. The unknown is scary. Yeah. We, we all fear the unknown, don't yeah. we? But yeah. I like what you said about it's not like what you expect it is, it isn't. It's not. I, it, yeah. it's not. But it's the thing that you need to find. Yeah. That's the that's the true beauty of this process yeah. is that you find exactly what you need to find in order to get you to the next step. It's like, yeah, like the teacher finds the student. You hear about that all yeah, the time. Yeah, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose – um, they don't always appear though. <laughs> Sometimes you really want. I've been looking for a teacher yeah. for ages. Eh? Um, <laughs> Glad. But people don't need to. I mean, look. Uh, you know, go into the passion if you're feeling. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's if you've, only, got, if you've got the if you've got the, the desire to do it, or you've yeah, got the motivation. That's to only it. one but way. Look, if if you're threatened by that or that, it's not a place to start. You know, like just take a walk for half an hour a day and don't bring your phone. Yeah. And make sure you go to some place where you're not going to run into people you know and just walk that's, for half an hour. That's you know? the point. Like, like, that's and, and that is that a legitimate step. Fine, you know? And Yeah, and for Good some start. people, that's that's where they need to start. Yeah, yeah. I definitely need to start just leaving my phone alone more, right? Eh? It's just always on me. And, but um, it's, it sounds to me like yeah. you're not really starting there. You've gone multiple steps down this path. You're like having conversations with you. It's clear that you're not really just starting, but that's a current block or obstacle yeah. for you. yeah. And, and so the thing is, this path that we're on, this journey of life in this we'll material form is like there are, we get faced with challenges that, and some of them we won't overcome, but some of them are exactly what we need at the right time to, to get us to that next level. Um, but to some degree, we've all done some of the work. And so when you come up against a challenge, if you actually face it head on, you actually get to bring with you all of the conquests you've had prior. Right. You know, that time that you were feeling sick and didn't want to go to school or you you didn't want to go to school so you pretended you were sick and then you you know did it anyway or there was a hard assignment you didn't want to do and you got it done or yeah. you know a hard game of football something like that yeah or you, like you need to apologize to someone because you said something in the wrong way and you really don't want to go over <laughs> and say sorry yeah but, right so yeah. overcoming this resistance is all part of that spiritual development process that or just development process so it's not as though you're starting you just got to keep going yeah no well said all right, I think I think that's um all my brain can, <laughs> can handle. I hope I hope you guys aren't disappointed if we wrap this up. But oh, that sounds fine. Thank yeah. you for for joining us again, gents. I had a really good time. Hope you guys enjoyed it too. Yeah, it was yeah, a lot I, of fun. I had a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good to hear. Thanks, I needed, needed that validation. <laughs> and if you liked this, oh, you subscribe to us on Rumble, hey eh, guys. Oh, sorry, I keep looking at Glenn. Hey guys, it's me talking to you. I'm talking to you and looking at you and talking to you. If you like what we're trying to do, please subscribe, like the video, do all that fun stuff. Tell us your thoughts about the controversy that these gents just shared i can't believe some of the things that they said uh and yeah thanks for listening thanks for if you got this deep into the podcast you must be enjoying what we're doing so i appreciate you listening thanks guys